guys is weird how well the tree of life and the tree of knowledge are in the garden. I put a brick phone in my and it was really good. And there's a tree of knowledge in the next floor. So what you want to do is to be in the downtown. And whatever we have, whenever we have a puzzle, there's got to be some insight or it's hinting at something that's trying to do something. And sometimes it's a lot of fun. Wow. Sometimes it's a lot of fun. Wow. Pass the gas at the table. Is there a sound on that? That just sounds like that. Um, from the I think I'll announce next Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really nice to see all of you again every week coming and participating in this special um, event, I guess you can call it, weekly event uh, program. I just wanted to let you know, for those of you that were here last year on Long Bover, we had an amazing barbecue, which was led by Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. Um, he did a great job in making the delicious food last year, and he, has, and he has again volunteered to do it this year. So we would love to see all of you bring your friends, bring new partners, and you will enjoy a delicious barbecue dinner from the uh, grill chef, Rabbi Yaakov Olvi, so... Uh, um, That's why I went to rabbi school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we're looking forward to, again, the barbecue pit will be next week on Love Overnight. Um, thank you, Nathaniel Tarlow, who likes to be called me. For sponsoring tonight's delicious dinner, we really appreciate it. And he will say a few words tonight, but before that, um, just want to introduce everybody. Well, be to come up and um, say something. Say something. Say something. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, as many of you know, last week um, I had the great privilege of going with another 52 other men, some from Houston as well on a great, great retreat, on a spring retreat to Kentucky. And we went through Bourbon, the Bourbon Trail, and we had a really fantastic time. But that program, although we had some torch representatives there, was run by Project Inspire and Jay Inspire. And we have the leaders of that organization here, Rabbi Chaim Sampson and Rabbi Simcha Barnett. Uh, and it's really a great privilege to have them here with us. I want to ask Rabbi Simcha to come up, say a few words, and then we'll have uh, Nate uh, say a few words in the memory of Shmuel Asher. My first time in Houston. It's great. Thank you so much for having us. Rabbi Walby and the missus. Great cook. If you don't know her, eh? Okay. So um, I'm doing a, a series on tefillah every day. So I haven't I had a thought today. We're starting Pesukit Zimri, which is the chapters of praise, really verses of song, literally, I guess, uh, that precede actual prayer, actual tefillah. And the, the there are two words that come up a lot in Pesukit Zimra for, for song. One is shira, and one is zimra. Two, two words for song. Shira, to sing. But zimra is interesting because the, the root of the word is is um, to prune. You, know, you prune a tree. It is, it is, is, is the root of that word of a zemer. So what's the idea? You have some, a song when you sing, which is a positive action, a, a loving action, calling out, and you know, to Kodesh Baruch, to Hashem. And then there's this idea of cutting back. So Shlomo HaMelech says in Shira Shirin, the whole, the whole song is a, is a love song between Really, it's a man and a woman, but the, al it's the, the allegory is a, man, is a man and a woman. The allegory is to the Jewish people of Hashem. 
that each one of us should be lovesick, should have a relationship with Hashem, which is the same way you'd have with your intended, with your spouse. That type of, it's all you could think about. It's all you want to think about, all you want to be with. The idea of shira, this spontaneous song that you would, like I sing to my wife, you know, shira. No, but there's another aspect. It's very hard to access that connection and relationship to Hashem. It's very deep, it's very much inside of us, and it's available, but we can sublimate sometimes that yearning for other types of relationships, which might not be so appropriate, which might not necessarily have that kedusha, that holiness, that, that beauty that is reserved for Hashem. So those things we want to prune. We want to express sheer in a positive way, and we want to prune back hold back the negativity that sometimes we can we come into play when we're lovesick, so to speak. You know, I suppose it's like Ava and Yira, two different aspects of relationship to Hashem. One is love, which we're very familiar with, but you also need that, that awe, that fear, that respect of the person who your love is going towards. You need that or you don't really have true love. So that's an idea about Zmira and, and Shira. And Rabbi Schwab in his in his safe on tefillah, asked the question, why do we have to praise Hashem to begin with? Praise and acknowledge Him before we start. And he, he, he answers, and I think that the point is that if you think that prayer is all about getting what you want, getting your needs fulfilled, then praise and, and, and acknowledgement of who Hashem is is really demeaning to Him. He doesn't need your praise. One of my rabbis once said it's like the praises of an idiot, you know, to, in terms of to God. What kind of praise can we possibly give to God, and why would God need our praise? Right? But the idea is that we need to praise God, because <clears throat> prayer is not about getting your needs fulfilled. It's about a relationship. It's about a connection. And when you're about to connect to, to Hashem, you want to know who you're connecting to. You want to know in detail. You want to unpack who that being is, so you can really have an incredibly fulfilling connection those three times a day. Because that's more important. The needs, God, God willing, we'll get what we need, more so necessarily than what we want. But the real thing that we have is this connection. That's why praise and acknowledgement is so very important, because we want to take that connection. And God willing, we should have Shira, hear a lot of Shira from the torch and from Houston and a lot of Zmiros, and we should also have that, that connection to HaKadosh Bar. Thank you, Rabbi Simcha Barnett. And just as a quick uh, reminder uh, that we are going to hopefully be invited, hopefully, uh, to more of these Jay Inspire trips. We did a second level trip to Israel uh, in February, which was remarkable. And uh, hopefully we're looking forward to doing uh, many more trips with them. So if you're interested, Nate, you're coming. Um, so are you. Uh, so uh, let me know and we'll be able to uh, We'll be able to get you on those trips with us. Now we're going to hear from Nate Carroll. Good morning. I actually do prefer Nathaniel. Uh, so I want to just say one thing in furtherance of what Rabbi Barnett said. Uh, to you, Rabbi. That was that was very insightful. Uh, here in, in Texas, where it's nice and sunny, there's a lot of fruit trees. I grow citrus, pomegranate. Uh, things like that, and you mentioned pruning. Remember that when you prune something like a fruit tree, it not only grows, but grows back much better. So it's, it's not just pruning, it's also guidance. And uh, I wanna thank you for getting us started off on that note. I also wanna thank each and every one of you all for coming out to uh, Partners in Torah, it's a great use of everyone's time, and for honoring my uncle, Samuel Losher, Alava Shalom, uh, and his neshama, thank you for that. So. This week's parashat is parashat Emor. Say, that's what that means. And this is a very interesting parashat because a lot is going on in this particular parashat this time in the Jewish people's history. Now, what's so interesting about this parashat is that it is really a transitional parashat. We are transitioning. Where are the Jewish people at this time? They're in Sinai. They have left Eretz Mitzrayim. They have not entered Eretz Yisrael. They're in between. They are undergoing this metamorphosis. And if you look at previous parashot, you'll see something of a continuation of what we've been seeing. Hashem has been saying to us what his commandments are, what his requirements are. 
what we are to do for example in the construction of the mishkan we have a series of rules that were laid out as to how it's to be constructed what metals to use what woods to use what cloths to use what stones to use what quantities where in the mishkan they were to go these are very concrete things and that's where we were at that time in a state where we needed concrete statements from god why because let's think about the chronological and emotional aspects of where we were at that time we hadn't been gone from egypt very long in sinai we hadn't been free from the pharaohs physically and emotionally mentally very long so this is a slave mentality and as if that weren't enough let's consider beyond the emotional and beyond the, the mental where are we we're in the middle of the desert and what would be the one word that could best describe our status at that time it isn't lost it isn't even transitional it's dependent we were dependent on hashem for our physical needs manna had to fall from the heavens water had to be obtained from rocks and things like that we weren't providing for ourselves and when you are dependent on somebody that isn't very far removed from slavery so hashem put us in the desert for 40 years so that the previous generation could eventually die off and the age demographic could shift and the new generation without the previous baggage could enter eretz yisrael because that is the promise he made to us and we have a responsibility to do it right and you're not going to do it right if you're not mentally ready so back to why we had concrete rules that's what people who had left slavery could really understand the taskmaster said here are your orders here's what you do here's how you do it get it done now i'm not comparing hashem to a taskmaster but the mentality was the same so when you talk about the building of the mishkan there really isn't much analysis this much wood this type of stone this type of cloth this design that's it but in emor we have a gradual shift from concrete into more abstract now why do we have that because throughout the time that we were in the desert hashem is preparing us for nationhood we left uh, eretz yisrael and went to Egypt, a confederation of loose tribes. We were returning to Eretz Yisrael as what? Well, Hashem's plan was to return us there as a nation, to dwell there permanently, and to build a nation and sustain a nation there, in line with his promise. So you can't just hand somebody the keys to the car without driver's ed. And this is sort of like the driver's ed, if you will, for nation building. So we've shifted from the Mishkan now to more abstract things like what? Well, it starts out with rules for Kohanim. Uh, a lot of these rules are really purity related. Some of them are really understandable. Some may be a little bit less so, but the long and the short of it is, what Hashem is doing is now setting up a governmental system for us when we reach Eretz Yisrael to have already in place when we arrive to put into practice. So with the Kohanim, rules such as uh, purity rules, contact with the dead, uh, marital requirements, a Kohen cannot marry a woman who has been divorced, who is engaged in a harlotry, who is not pure. A Kohen Haggadol can't even marry a widow. He has to marry a virgin from among his people. These are ways of making sure that Hashem's emissaries in what will become the Beit HaMikdash in future are really on some level beyond reproach. When you, as the Kohen Gadol, marry a woman who is totally pure and you're basically as the parasha says required to stay in the sanctuary no one can say hey you know what i saw the kohen hagadol and uh you should hear about his wife and what she used to do oh and where did i see him shooting dice in a back alley after he left the liquor store you can't say that about somebody like that when the rules that are in place prevent the possibility of even a rumor like that from cropping up and why is that important? Because if the Kohanim lose credibility, Hashem loses credibility. And that's something we can't really afford to have happen when we have a covenant with Hashem and He has one with us. Now, we shift a little bit more into some of the things that maybe are a bit tougher to understand. The Kohen of Gadol has to have a respectable haircut. 
Don't really know why that is, don't know what that means, but some of these things maybe we aren't meant to understand. This is the way Hashem wants it, still concrete. Okay. And as we go further and further, we have now a broadening of requirements. Things like what is a proper sacrifice? What is uh, the process for the bread offerings made to Hashem and things like that? And why do we have those things? That's the forerunner of a tax system. That's a forerunner of what we're going to have when the Beit HaMikdash exists, when people have to come and make their offerings there. So just like we learned in Cain and Abel, it's not okay to come and not give your best to Hashem. It has to be pure. It has to be good. It has to be worthwhile because, hey, if you're not required to give Hashem your best, you're not necessarily going to think you have to give your best in a contract situation. You're not going to give your best in a professional situation. If you don't owe it to Hashem, why would you owe it to somebody you're doing business with? So this is a way of setting an example. And this is a way of saying, Hashem telling the people, I, Hashem, make you holy, and that holiness needs to flow from Hashem all the way out to every aspect of your life. And a lot of these rules are laid out in Amor. Now, we also have some interesting things going on here because we have the beginning of certain ethics that are going to be built upon in Judaism. We don't have the Talmud yet. We don't have the Mishnah. We don't have these things. But we have in, in Parashat Amor rules about how to treat animals. This is the beginning of those things. You cannot take an animal away from its mother after it's been born for seven days. On day eight, you can, you can at least do it then or later. And if that offspring is to be slaughtered, the mother cannot be slaughtered that same day. We are starting to show compassion for animals, and we are starting to have the beginnings of a welfare system. Because it's also written in this parasha that we cannot cut the edges of our field, that is a, or, the, or take the gleanings from the field. That is left for whom? For the poor and for the stranger. So we're also seeing not just the social welfare system starting to crop up, something every government needs, but also rules that apply to your fellow Jew and to strangers, to outsiders. So you're starting to see a parallel in treatment, and this will give rise to things like treating the stranger in your land as yourself and rules that make us a light unto the nation. I think what is the most telling of the abstract shift in Parashat Amor is that here we start having what? We start having a legal system. A legal system administered by us. This isn't a way of having us say to Hashem, we believe in you. This is where Hashem says, I, Hashem, believe in you, the Jewish people. Because we have laws laid out with things like the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth, financial compensation for killing uh, an animal, death penalty for murder, but it's up to us and our judicial system to administrate that. So that is a big step in developing as a nation when we have a legal system. And an application of that appears late in the parasha with the son of the Egyptian man who goes unnamed, the son himself goes unnamed, and the mother is named, and she's a Shlomit daughter of Dibri from the tribe of Dan. This man, this is a sort of a strangely placed story within the parasha because the parasha is laying out rules. And here at the very end, this man comes from outside the camp, wanders into the camp, has a quarrel with uh, one of the residents of the camp. And what's interesting is even though this man is born of a Jewish woman, this person who entered the camp,